Okay, so we see a bunch of uh, people have already joined us. Uh, first of all, welcome. Um, a couple things to note. Uh, when you join as attendee, you're like by default um, uh, muted. And, uh, but I do want to make sure you're able to hear us. So could someone put in the chat if you're able to hear us or not? Okay, great. So some people confirm that they can hear, which means if you're not able to hear us, then chances are it might be a local audio issue. Cool, awesome. Um, usually people like take a little bit of time to join, so we're just gonna hang out a little bit uh, for maybe another like couple of minutes. All right, so Manasa, if you don't mind uh, unsharing your screen, I have to like go through some slides and then uh, I'll switch back to you, uh, you know, uh, momentarily. Sure. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Yes. Yes, please. Cool. Awesome. So I believe I am sharing my screen now. Um, while we're waiting for more people to join, I'm just gonna quickly like go over what this track is all about. Cause I know like since the new year, a bunch of people joined. So, uh, you know, you're at an event with what we call data science and machine learning. Um, so DataPy is actually a conference we run annually dedicated to everything Python, machine learning, data science, et cetera, et cetera. So um, let's go to the next slide. So we are a mostly community driven, uh, you know, team and pretty much like this does not exist without our volunteers. So I want to take a moment to honor and appreciate our volunteers. We have Adeline who's a um, uh, master of like social media, all things events, getting our logistics in order. Uh, she's a data analyst with Gamelon. We also have Sumana who's a, a senior data scientist uh, specializing in platform machine learning with ServiceNow. We also have uh, Professor Kapoor, um, who is a best-selling author and also a very well-known professor in India specializing in deep learning. So uh, awesome people involved. Uh, Y'all are in pretty good hands. Uh, this is me, I'm Maddie Shang. Um, I uh, study at University of Waterloo, I am Canadian. Uh, and then I became a startup founder and then eventually ended up teaching myself how to code. Currently I'm a uh, machine learning researcher uh, and uh, machine learning engineer. I'm working on Federated Learning via grants uh, supported by PyTorch and Facebook. Um, I am, you know, leading this track. And uh, yeah, I fly airplanes and do other things like that for fun. So uh, data science actually started last March. And what we started was basically just like me, uh, one person. Um, somehow we ended up being very popular and growing very rapidly. Uh, this is, you know, this slide is a little bit out of date, but right now we have over a thousand uh, mostly professional engineers um, active in the community. Uh, most of our speakers are actually first timers and they so far have always had a good experience. And, uh, you know, we do things other than just like teach you technical skills. We, we assist with like salary negotiations and like understanding the job search, the markets. And uh, in the last year, we were able to train about 180 new data scientists via our uh, three-part free remote and online um, data science bootcamp. And we also taught a bunch of people like deep learning and machine learning via you know, webinars uh, related to TensorFlow and et cetera. So um, as you know, this community is mostly uh, you know, built on Slack and it's very important that we engage with each other on Slack. So here's some examples of like people engaging and then you know, exchanging value with each other. So anytime if you have a question or anything like you, you feel like other people might be able to provide feedback for, um, please do, you know, ask for help in the help me channel. Uh, people that would like people can help you and we can like, you know, uh, support active community. This is some of the events we ran last year. As you know, we have a, uh, like a, I guess a global overall conference called Connect and that's happening again, I think in March in San Francisco. 
And on top of that, we have a specific conference dedicated to data science and machine learning. So uh, we're always looking for speakers, volunteers, people to get involved in that. So there is that. Once again, you know, uh, the channels you really should know about is the Help Me channel and the Track Events channel. The Track Events channel is where we announce all our, um, you know, upcoming events and uh, where we uh, share the videos and recordings and the notebooks of our previous events. And then uh, if you ever, you know, like end up confused or have questions about the content, anything related to data science or machine learning, you should join the Help Me channel, put your question in there, be as, uh, be as specific as possible. And that way a technical volunteer will usually pick up and like help you out uh, to, to the point of like, they will actually jump in and pair code with you usually within a couple hours a day, but you know, this timing varies because we're all volunteers. Um, some cool events we've done in the past, some, you know, events that we have coming up. And uh, I guess in the next couple of days, I will be asking you to vote which ones you're more interested in. Um, a couple other announcements. We're actually looking for people to like nominate uh, for the One Who Code Awards. So if you know someone in this community or not, who's like, you know, doing good, interesting things and it's helping you or you feel like they need recognition, then feel free to like nominate them here. Uh, um, and then uh, we're also looking for fellows to run all the tracks. So I'm gonna be stepping down from my current position and someone needs to take over. So we're also looking for, uh, uh, for, for people to essentially replace me and uh, to like continue to lead this community. So if you're interested, uh, I will post the links into the Slack channel. Um, this is our vision. Basically, we just want a world where people are like equally represented and treated fairly. And uh, this is our code of conduct. Uh, basically, like just do a gut check, right? Are you being a good member of the community? Are you contributing value? Are you being positive? If you can say yes to those things, then chances are it's fine. If you feel like someone's uh, being like not a positive member of the community, feel free to contact us. We take it very seriously and we're very protective of our members. Um, the other thing I do want to mention that despite our name having the word woman in it, we're actually like welcoming for all people. Anyone is welcome as long as they're able to be a positive member of the community. And that is my little spiel. Cool. I am going to hand it over to Sumana, who is our awesome speaker. She's a uh, data scientist with the Home Depot. Uh, one of our sponsors, and she will today explain to you how you can do multiple regression models, understand their characteristics, and also pick the final one that is best for your purpose, basically uh, all at the same time with like a small amount of code. So take it, uh, take it away, Sumna. Hey, um, can I share my screen now? Yep, there you go. One second. Yes, I hope everybody can see my screen now. Let me see. Just uh, um, one second. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, guys. Today, all those people who've suffered from sleeplessness, anxiety, and restlessness. Yes, all of you, you are in good hands. Um, in the next one hour, we're going to go through deep meditation and ensure you get some sound sleep. Just kidding, guys. Um, I want you all to be alert and awake. Um, Please bear with me, I'm using Zoom for the first time and my computer is also acting up. Uh, just a second, I'm going to disconnect and share one more time. Um, yes. Okay. Where's the zone? Hmm. Okay. Yes, uh, I hope I'm back again. Um, please get multiple cups of coffee if necessary. Thank you, 
the next one hour will be very useful and something you cannot find in YouTube right now. Um, so we will be talking about code architecture using Python, regression, and regularization. Most of the important topics for data scientist interviews and project works. So do let me know um, if you're able to see my screen now. Yes, about myself, I am a data scientist with five years of work experience in retail and marketing. I'm currently working as a senior analyst at search and recommendations at the Home Depot. Um, I enjoy solving abstract problems for my users by mathematical formulation, gathering relevant data, cleaning data, applying models, training and evaluation, deployment, and finally tracking key performance indicators. Um, my go-to tools are Python, SQL, and Tableau. I love yoga for health and well-being, and I practice it every day. Uh, I also have a toddler, and I absolutely enjoy every second I get with him. So um, before we start the presentation, let's get some of the prerequisites. I assume that you have some familiarity with basic machine learning algorithms and are comfortable programming with Python. We will be using Jupyter Notebooks interface for going through the code. Current version of uh, Python used here is 3.7 and uh, Jupyter 1.0. Your system would also need to have NumPy, Pandas, and Scikit-learn. Typing extensions and Plot9 installed, but don't worry about installing each of these packages because you will use Poetry to set up the environment for you. Um, the instructions are in the GitHub. Let me share a link with you. Hmm. How do I do that? Chat. Right. Um, all panelists and attendees. So I hope everybody has um, is able to get my message. Um, just confirm if you can. I've just shared the link to my GitHub uh, repository, where there's code, data, and everything for you to follow along. Great. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to switch back and um, let me also know if you're, you should be able to see my um, screen now. Awesome. Um, so uh, Poetry is a packaging and dependency manager. It allows you to manage your Python projects. The main file of your Poetry project is the pyproject.toml file. This is the place where you define the requirements and the project metadata uses this file to resolve dependencies. But you don't have to worry about setting up one as I've already created the file for you to run this project. You need to first install Python 3.7 and activate your environment, then install Poetry inside the Python environment. You can use Conda create a Python environment, the rest package and environment is taken care of by Poetry. So the instructions for Python installation and Poetry are in the GitHub repo. Um, we will be going over code architecture, regression, and regularization, and I will provide a brief introduction to regression, regularization, to refresh your memory before walking over the code. So let's get started. So um, the goal of regression is to predict a continuous response variable given some input variables. There are different regression models available. Some are meaningful and relevant for your problem and some not so much. We are interested in learning which models are best for your problem and data set. How do we do this? We need to identify the relevant models from the non-relevant ones. For example, linear regression for predicting a continuous variable is a relevant model, while logistic regression is not. Though the name is misleading, logistic regression is actually used for classification. So how do we say one model is better than another? There are many measures that are used, one of which is R-square. One caveat to call to attention is R-square is not the best metric to evaluate multiple variable regression, but it is the most looked at. 
if r square is low, it means there is no linear relationship. If r square is high, there is a possibility of relationship. We also need to look at r square for training and test data. Test r square is more reliable because training r square is a result of data used to build the r square, right? Model metrics from training data are like begging the question. Test R square is also an indicator of model generalization. That is how well does the model perform on unseen data. Writing code to explore different models is a time consuming process, not to mention the bulky code it creates. Therefore it needs automation. So here is one such tool which automates all required functions, the built wrapper function that creates an architecture for the code, enables less cumbersome and more manageable code that is also easier to debug. <clears throat> so we will be using a toy data set, automobile MPG to follow along. We use this data set to predict the number of miles per gallon and an automobile can run for. This is a continuous uh, variable, hence this is a regression problem. The features used for prediction are the number of cylinders the car has, um, and displacement is the size of the car's engine in liters, horsepower, weight, acceleration, and age of the car. This data set has been cleaned and pre-processed for the purpose of this tutorial. Data pre-processing is a topic on its own, and if it's not done correctly, it can result in misleading conclusions. I'll not cover pre-processing here. Relevant regression models under consideration are linear regression, ridge, lasso, elastic net, support vector regression, stochastic gradient descent, k nearest neighbors, decision trees. We will try to cover as many as possible in the time frame. So model workflow in life is process oriented. It all starts with sourcing data. Is there enough data for the model to start detecting patterns? Sourcing data and curating features is the first step and it's not covered here today. Um, exploratory data analysis is where you understand the data trends, patterns, and outliers and thorough visualizations. It provides the context needed to develop appropriate model and interpret results correctly. Data preparation and pre-processing is massaging the data to make it suitable for model algorithms. This is a common requirement for many machine learning algorithms implemented in um, Cyclotron. They may behave badly if the individual features do not more or less look like standard or normally distributed data. Train and test splits are performed on data as the goal of machine learning is to find prediction on unseen data. The ML model learns patterns from data that is used to train it and needs to be evaluated on unseen data to learn if it also generalizes well. The test holdout data serves this purpose of model validation. Typically, many models are tried on the data sets and the best performing model is chosen for production and deployment. There are many evaluation um, model scoring metrics which allow for comparison between models and the model with the best score is considered the best model. I want to pause here and um, check to see if there are any questions and looks like none. So we're going to continue. Um, okay. <clears throat> Look at simple linear regression problems where the input or X variable is along the X axis and the response or Y variable is along the Y axis. A scatter, plot, a scatter plot is shown in the figure. Red points are the data used for training and blue points are the data used for testing. What is considered a good model to fit the data? A curve has a good fit if the distances of the points from the fitted curve are small. So we can draw a curve that passes through every point in the training data. Would this be a good fit? Well, it does fit the training data very well, but if you were to use this curve to fit new data points or unseen data, it fits poorly. It is also evident that a different training subset would have resulted in a different curve. So given points in red are training data and blue are test data, 
This model has good performance in training and poor performance in test data. Such a model is called an overfit model. So to the right, the algorithm returns best fit line given the training data using a polynomial function of degree k. If the training data were to shift a little, the best fit curve would also change. So this function fits the training data very well, but generalizes poorly. Often, our goal in regression is to predict for unknown data, and, the, and functions like these will result in high variation on unknown data. On the left, we have the case of underfitting, where the error in the training data set is large, and the error in unseen data will also be large. So regularization is a method to overcome the problem of overfitting. In this process, we try to keep all variables in the model, but try to reduce the coefficients of the variables. As a result, coefficients of some variables are much higher than the coefficients of other variables, which controls the prediction, right? Um, in L2 regularization, we add a penalty to the cost function of regression, and um, this is called regularization constant alpha. And we, we're looking at alpha times the square of the coefficients. So alpha ranges from zero to infinity. And zero value of alpha reduces our cost function to just linear regression cost function. And increasing alpha forces the magnitude of coefficients to shrink. So what is an optimal value of alpha? This is not determined by the regularization model, but rather is a hyperparameter. We experiment with different values of alpha on different data and decide the best value for our data set. Hence, it reduces the model complexity by coefficient shrinkage using L2 norm. It shrinks the magnitude of the coefficients and also reduces multicollinearity. L1 regularization does a similar thing using a different penalty, L1. It shrinks the absolute value of the coefficients. Even with small values of alpha, some of the coefficients are forced to zero. Hence, it can also be considered as a feature selection tool. Generally useful when we have more number of features. Elastic net is a combination of both L1 and L2 penalties, combination of ridge and lasso. It has two parameters to control the extent of L1 and L2 penalties in the model. L1 term and alpha are the two hyperparameters here. So L1 ratio of zero is equivalent to ridge regression and a ratio of one is lasso regression. So sklearn has many linear model implementations. Many models share common inputs, like the data you feed to the model, and might share some common hyperparameters as well. But they also have many different hyperparameters. So let us take a look at lasso, ridge, and elastic net models in sklearn. While they all share the regularization parameter alpha, L1 ratio parameter is exclusive to elastic net. L2 regularization is implemented under the ridge linear model in sklearn. Alpha is a positive valued hyperparameter to this model, the constant that multiplies the L2 term. The value of alpha is predetermined and is not computed by the model. Generally, you try different values of alpha and decide which value suits your data better. Larger values specify stronger regularization. Alpha equals zero is equivalent to ordinary least squares. The other hyperparameters in this implementation are fit intercept, which is Boolean. If it is true, the intercept will be computed for non-centered data. Normalize, max, iter, tolerance are other hyperparameters implemented here. Um, please read scikit-learn documentation carefully if you plan on using these features. Then um, lasso is a linear model trained with L1 penalty as a regularizer. Alpha is a hyperparameter to this linear model. It is the regularization constant that multiplies the L1 term. Lasso is also optimizing the same objective function as elastic net with L1 ratio parameter equals one. Other parameters to this implementation are fit intercept, normalize, max height or tall, et cetera. 
Elastic net is a linear model with combined L1 and L2 priors as regularizers. Regularization constant alpha is present in this implementation as well. There is a new elastic net mixing parameter called L1 ratio parameter. It has to be a value between zero and one, which specifies the extent of L1 and L2 penalties. If L1 ratio is zero, the penalty is L2 penalty. And with L1 ratio one, the penalty is L1 penalty. The fit and percept, normalize, max iter, and tall parameters are present in the elastic net model as well. So you can see how this impacts your code. You need to have a different script to train different models because of different model parameters, right? So the idea of building models works on a constructive feedback principle. You build a model, get feedback from metrics, make improvements, and continue till you achieve a desirable accuracy. Evaluation metrics explain the performance of a model. An important aspect of evaluation metrics is their capability to discriminate among model results. After you've finished building your model, these metrics will help you in evaluating your model's accuracy. Root mean square error, also known as RMSE, is the square root of average of squared errors. While this is a good metric that gives a sense of how close the predicted values are to the actual value, there is no baseline to say a specific value is considered good and no baseline for comparison between different models. So R squared metric is the proportion of variation of sum of square deviation from the mean that is explained by the model. In other words, how good is our regression model compared to a very simple model that just predicts the mean value of response from the training set as predictions? So how much of variation of the response is explained by the regression? If it is zero, your model isn't explaining anything. If it is closer to one, your model is getting better at predicting the response. R square doesn't consider the number of variables in the model. So it doesn't penalize complex models. Rather, complex models tend to have non-decreasing R squares. That is, as you add more and more variables to your model, R square only increases. Hence, this metric should be used with caution. For the purpose of our dummy data, we will consider using R square for evaluation. Adjusted R square takes the number of features into account and penalizes more complex models. This is generally a better metric for multivariate regression. So if you and I are two data scientists tasked with building some linear models for this data set, we will end up with different scripts and implementations. Many data science assets are developed in a non-collaborative nature. For example, if you're trying to implement Euclidean distance for two vectors, I might use for loops while you might use linear algebraic equation that solves in one line of code. We often tend to rely on our websites like Stack Exchange to convert our mathematical formulations into code and the sites we stumble upon shape our codes. Reusability of code built like this um, is often limited. Hence, data science assets shouldn't be a collection of scripts that are implemented. Generally, documentation for the ad hoc scripts is also much harder if it is done at all. Scattered components make it hard to retrace and replicate previous work, resulting in poor quality of code. So scalability and maintainability is also harder. With interactive, um, with interactive tools like Minitab, each model build requires many clicks. And if you need to rerun a model with different parameter, guess what? You'd have to go through the clicks all over again. So I hope I have convinced you that one standardized function for all linear models with the same parameters, which wraps all complexity inside it, makes the life of a data scientist a lot easier. So um, without further delay, let's jump into the code and look at the implementation details. I hope everyone is able to see uh, my notebook. 
One second. Okay. Let me check quickly um, the chat area. Um, if anybody can confirm if you're able to see my code. Also want to check the Q&A section. There seems to be one question now. Oh, I think I got a question from Priyash. Um, and the question is, understand what L1 shrink, you understand that L1 shrinks coefficients to zero and it is good for feature selection. When do you prefer elastic net over lasso? Um, honestly, in my opinion, uh, and what I'm going to walk through now is I would try all models um, and also get, if you have a really good sized data, um, just see which model has the best performance. And if it turns out that simpler models have better performance, I would prefer the simpler models over the more complex one. And we will walk through that a little bit later in the code as well. Okay. And now let's get back to the code. Okay. Um, so I wanted to show you how I organize my code to compare and validate different machine learning models. I'll explain this using the example of linear regression. Um, and we are using the automobile MPG data set. Um, it's generally a good practice to have all your import statements at the top of the notebook. This helps people who are looking at your notebook easily understand all packages that you will need to run the notebook. Um, and so as you can see here in the code, um, we're doing uh, all the standard in imports over here, NumPy, plots, and pandas and also importing all the linear models and metrics from scikit-learn. Um, this code is available in GitHub repo, so you can uh, walk through it later line by line. We will be using a toy data set, um, automobile MPG to follow along, and we are going to predict the number of miles per gallon an automobile can run for. Um, like I said, this is a continuous variable. Therefore, this is a regression problem. Um, the features we're going to use for prediction here are the number of cylinders the car has, um, the size of the car engine in liters, horsepower, weight, acceleration of the car, and age of the car. Um, in this step over here, I'm just uh, reading the file and then looking at the first uh, few records of data. So let us see if we can identify the different factors that affect the mileage of a car. So do you think cars with bigger engines use more fuel than cars with smaller engines? Well, we could do a quick uh, scatter plot to see the relationship between the engine size and the miles per gallon. And we see that as the size of the engine increases, the mileage definitely goes down. We can also try to fit our own line to the data set. So what is happening to mileage as the engine size is increasing? And this, there seems to be a decreasing trend, which um, isn't a surprise. Now, data scientists generally spend majority of their time on tidying up data. So this involves dealing with missing data, corrupted data, munching data from different sources into a single table, and so on. Um, this is not the focus of the talk today, so I'm going to use this pre-processed data set um, for the rest of the talk, and I've also included that data in GitHub. Um, so what is the structure of our code going to be? Uh, I have used um, typing module. Now, typing module provides runtime support for type hints. A type alias is defined by assigning a type to the alias. For example, model data that you see here is a named tuple. It has inputs and it has targets. As you can see, type aliases are useful for simplifying complex type signatures. Um, and type hints are also useful as they act as self-documentation and make it easier to read code. It helps in catching bugs without actually running the code. We can also use it to create code structures. 
their templates and blueprints for creating classes and functions. And I have defined a um, bunch of those here, which you can follow along um, later on. So let me take you to the wrapper function I was talking about. So this is the try model function. And uh, I wanted to give you some examples and a feel for how to use this function before we dive into how it is implemented. So um, this is a function that allows you to try different linear models on your data set. Usage examples would be, um, maybe you wanna try linear regression model on your data, and you would do that by calling the try model function, passing the linear regression function to the model trainer, and uh, you would pass the data frame, specify what are the input columns, specify what the target column is, and um, pass on validation functions or plotting functions that you'd like to see, also specify what the test size is. Um, and this parameter controls for uh, the subset of data that is set aside for evaluating the model. Um, so, or you might want to try the same linear model, but try different hyperparameters. And you could do that as well using the try model function. And you would call the partial function here. And basically in this example, I am training elastic net regression uh, model, but with different regularization parameters. So I have specified all the values that I want my model to be trained on in a list over here. And I will loop through each of the alpha in that list and train models. You could also try different linear models. Um, in this example, I think I'm, I'm training a linear support vector regression, K nearest neighbors regression, stochastic gradient descent regression, and decision tree regression. And I'm um, essentially putting all the models I want to try in a list, and I'm going to loop and iterate through the list and train these different models. So why is this function necessary? it would be many more lines of code to achieve the same task without this function. So for example, if you wanted to try simple linear regression without the function, you have to first standardize the data set, then create the train and test splits, instantiate the linear regression object and specify the hyperparameters. And then you would call the fit function on it, on the training data, then call the predict function on the test data, and calculate your own R-square metrics, write your own plotting functions to visualize results. And if you wanted to try another linear model, say elastic net, you have to execute all of these steps all over again and write another bunch of code. So this creates bulky code that's harder to scale and manage. And the try model function is essentially simplifying this process to a great extent. Um, let's get back to the top to look at the parameters of this uh, model. So the inputs to the function are the linear model that should be tried on the data. Linear models could be linear regression, lasso, ridge, elastic net, uh, LARS, et cetera. And the second input to the function is the data. And then we are also specifying what are the input variables to the model and what is the target variable under the input columns and the target columns. And um, you can also specify the validation and plot functions um, in the same function. And by default, 20% of the data is reserved for test or holdout set, and the remaining data is used to train the model. This can be changed by changing the parameter test size. Try data transformation for non-centered data using the data transform parameter. So the default here is dummy. If you don't apply anything, it just returns the data as is. The first step is to define model data by separating independent and response variables into inputs and targets. And if data transformation is specified, the inputs are transformed with the chosen method. Data is split into test and training, model is trained, and chosen plots are displayed, and the function returns validation metrics. So that is what the function is doing. So let us now take a look at the functions that are used in order to build this. So over here, Ensure2D takes input data and transforms them 
to do di dimensions using numpy um, dot reshape. Most of the scikit-learn models um, actually need uh, this, which is why this function will take care of that for you. Then standard um, scaling, which is a data transformation function that centers the data around zero with unit variation. We also have a dummy data transform here, which returns the data as is. Then there is a simple, simple validation function, which calculates R square scores for test and training data sets using R2 score from um, scikit-learn metrics. And um, there is a function to create the data splits and splits your data essentially into test and training subsets following the test split size specified. You can see here that data transformation is actually done before splitting the data. Um, then we have a plotting function, uh, which currently plots predicted response values against actual values for the test data. This is a very simple plotting function that should give us an indication of model performance. You can go ahead and use this um, structure to generate a bunch of other plotting functions and call them as well in the try model function. So using the functions defined above, the try model function code is also is actually very simple. Um, it's very, very easy to write our wrapper function. We first identify the inputs and targets for the data set and transform the data set if um, that is specified. And then we split the data into test and, oh, sorry, into the test and training sets over here. And we plot the results of the model with the plotting function of choice and return the validation metrics for the model and data. So let us try a linear regression model on the data. This is a linear regression function. And uh, in this function, we are identifying the train and test um, the, the input and the target variables. And in the next step, we instantiate the linear regression model object with interested parameters. We then call fit method and return the fitted object. So to train a linear regression using our function, we simply pass the linear regression um, to the model trainer. And, um, and now what I like to do is uh, train multiple models and compare the performance of multiple models by the side. So I am going to save all results to a dictionary with the key of the dictionary being the model trained and the values are the R square scores of test and training data set. So that is what my result dict is doing. I'm calling my first model simple linear regression and um, let's take a look at the results. So it appears that the test score for this model is uh, 0.65 and the training score is um, point, uh, training R square score is 0.71. So what I would now like to do is train a multiple linear regression model and compare the performance of multiple uh, of these two models by the side. So it's going to be the same. The only difference is we're still going to pass the linear regression function to the model trainer, but now we have more input columns, right? We have weight, displacement, horsepower, and acceleration. Essentially, we've thrown in all the other um, features in the data, input features in the data set. So for this model, I am naming it the multiple regression uh, using all variables and saving the results into a results dictionary. Now, if I were to call the results dictionary, I can see the results of both models here. Um, so it appears that the multiple regression has a training score of 0.7, which is slightly lower than the training score of our simple regression model. And um, this uh, multiple regression model also has a test score of 0.7. So in a similar manner, um, we're going to do a third model, which is a parsimonious uh, regression model. And um, I've only provided two inputs here, the weight and the age. And the model returns 
Oh, it actually returns high test and training scores. Both are around um, training scores. R square score is at 0.79, and the test R square score is at 0.82. This model so far outperforms our other two models. Um, in a similar way, we can also do lasso regression model. Lasso regression has the regularization parameter alpha, and here I'm setting it to 0.5. Calling the lasso model on the data, we see um, a test score of 0.69, R square score, and a training R square score of 0.7. And in a similar manner, we could do ridge regression as well, which also has the regularization parameter. And the results for the ridge regression are over here. So now let's actually look at elastic net regression model, which has many parameters. There is regularization constant alpha, L1 ratio, max iterations, et cetera. So the function is defined in the same way as the functions above. Um, in the first step, we identify what are the inputs and the targets. In the second step, we instantiate the elastic net regression objects with the hyperparameters um, and values of interest for the hyperparameters. Then we fit the model and return the fitted object back. So when we call, when we try it on our data set, and suppose we are interested in trying the elastic net regression, not with the default parameters specified here, but uh, with different parameters, then we would use the strict where you can call the partial function and pass that function and also different values of parameters. So here I'm passing an alpha of zero, which boils it down to simple linear regression. Um, and the results for the elastic net regression are, test has an R square score of 0.66 and the training data set has an R square score of 0.71. In a similar manner, I have to find a bunch of other linear models, um, linear support vector regression, k nearest neighbors regression, stochastic gradient descent regression, and decision tree regression. And um, over here, um, I am just calling all those functions simultaneously. I assign them to the different models I want to try, and I'm iterating through each and every model and saving the results. And um, I'm also saving all the results of the models into my results dictionary. And um, I have downloaded the R square scores for each model and visualized the scores. So let us jump back to the presentation. Okay, so looking at the results of all model strain, we see that our simple model considering weight and age of cars as inputs turns out to outperform all other models. Both the test and training scores are higher with 78% R square score in the test and 82% R square score in the training. Hmm. There is some truth to less is more after all. This holds to be good in many real world problems as well, where we can often substitute simpler models with, um, we can often substitute complex models with simpler models in exchange for a number of advantages, such as increased precision, simpler and more informative interpretations, cost savings, etc. And so my next steps are taking the automation to the next level. In the next version, the user needs to only specify explanatory and response variables. The function will look into all appropriate and relevant models to the provided input, implement all models, and return evaluation scores. It will return the fitted model with the best scores. This will save a ton of time uh, for data scientists to focus on other details. And that brings me to the very end of the presentation. Before concluding, I'd like to thank and provide credits to Pluralsight and specifically Janani Ravi. My presentation is inspired from her course, 
there are so many people who guided me and supported me in so many ways for this presentation to happen. I am not naming them, but you know who you are. Thank you so much for making this happen for me and finally the audience. It couldn't happen without you. Thank you so much for your time and for this opportunity to present. I hope you had some key takeaways that you can use in your fields of work. Please use my code or portions of it and let me know how you implement it in your walks of life. Reach out to me if you have any questions um, at manasa.kudamella at gmail.com. I would love to learn from your experience on how you implement this and make it better. Additionally, if you have any feedback on my presentation style, logical flow or material, please let me know. I would love changes and make it better for future audience. Um, now I will open this up for questions and, oh, I see there are two questions here. Uh, sorry, um, the GitHub link, let me post the GitHub link one more time. I think um, for those of you who've joined in a little later, uh, I apologize if you weren't able to see this before, but okay, to so all panelists and attendees. Yep, so this is Maddie back again. Uh, if you weren't here earlier, I lead the machine learning, machine learning and data science community for Google Code. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions related to the content or related to the community. And uh, the more questions you ask, the more everybody learns. So, oh, Manasa, I think uh, Ding Shen has another question. Did you want to answer that one as well? Oh, um, let me look at that. Uh, how do you? Oh, how do you manage the computation time of running different models? Um, I think that's a great question. This being a toy data set, um, it didn't take honestly very long to run that. Um, but typically, uh, at least at Home Depot, we have Google platform, cloud platform, and uh, generally I don't run intensive models on my laptop. I rather like to use um, the shared resources because there is Jupyter um, Hub and things like that, which have, which have more computational power. And so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, actually, uh, I think Aditya also provided uh, their experience. So uh, on a subset of data and then filter model. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. So, um, you know, regression models are, along with like gradient boosted decision trees are probably the two most commonly deployed models because they're simple, interpretable, and uh, like more scalable. But for people who have to do research, like myself, who has to use like really intensive like models with a lot of parameters and eat a lot of compute, um, like, you know, like my models typically have like a couple of thousands of like parameters and nodes. Um, uh, it, it is very common to run the models and do exploratory data analysis on a balanced subset of the data, which is, I think, what Aditya mentioned. The other thing you can do is actually, um, you know, use your breaks and use your, like, evening time to, <laughs> to uh, essentially make the computer do the work and while you relax, right? So it's very common if I know I'm going to be comparing, like, say, uh, four models with, uh, with, like, a lot of different parameters and I expect them to run on time. If I don't wanna pay for like actual heavy duty like AWS instances, I can actually just uh, use a spot instance um, and let it run overnight. And next morning, uh, the results are already saved. The models with the best uh, weights have been checkpointed and saved. So I can basically pick up and go again, right? This is where um, computers or humans can like, interactively, uh, you know, like work, work together and make progress while I'm sleeping, you know, AWS doing, doing the hard work. The other thing I do want to mention is that um, uh, Google has a hosted uh, Jupyter Notebook instance called Google Colab, and uh, usually they do provide a, a GPU or sometimes uh, even like a TPU backend. So I also frequently make liberal use of that. 
Thank you, Manny. There seems to be another question posted. Um, what's the best model while analysis data has only sales values? I'm not sure if I follow. Maddie, do you want to? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. So um, if I'm interpreting this question correctly, uh, Qingmei sounds like you have a, just a like one row of data or one column of data. And that's basically just uh, like time series data on sales, right? So in that case, um, what you're looking for is a like probably auto regressive time series model. So basically the only feature you have is like your sales in the previous periods, either weekly, monthly or quarterly. And then using the last little bit of time, you have to predict the next one, right? Uh, luckily, you know, like uh, time series data of that nature are well studied. And there is a class of model called ARIMA that performs very well in this. Uh, you might also want to try, try some uh, recurrent neural network models uh, like LSTM if you have a, like a long series of data, if you have many data points. So uh, I can type the specific model names into the answer. So ARIMA models and uh, like, I guess, LSTMs. Current neural networks, GRU, oh, LSTM. Cool. Um, anyone have any other questions about uh, like this community, what we're doing next? Do you have any suggestions or feedback or about the content? Anything related to data science, machine learning, careers, why not? We're here to help. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Pre Priyash. Oh, that. Priyash, do you want to like type your actual question again? <laughs> uh, Deepika has a question which I will answer first. So Deepika is asking, do we have more sessions for beginners? Um, yes. So. The, the goal of this community is help you level up regardless of your current level, right? If you're like just new to programming, you're like, hey, I don't know if data science is something I want to do. We have resources ready for that. Uh, and if you're like, you know, like me, like more more into like cutting edge research or you're like, you know, more into the math and the, the naughty underlying belly details, then we also have a like research study group where we read a paper and then uh, each, each members will like discuss and then we actually implement key parts of the paper um, so that, you know, we'll make it available for other people. So yes, there will be many sessions. If you're already part of the Slack, you will notice that we frequently pull the community for, uh, um, for, for what your goals are, how we get best help. We allow you to choose like, uh, like what you, what you feel like is, you know, the next couple of sessions that's most relevant to you. So make sure you participate in those polls. Otherwise, like organize, organizers like me, like we're all volunteers. We don't necessarily have data. So we just try to make it more useful for you. Um, more specifically, I do want to share my screen real quick. Um, Manasa, okay, do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, awesome. So I will share my screen quickly. So uh, I want to give you a tour of Slack, right? So if you join Slack, you land it at the, this page and there's like a bunch of polls over here. This is exactly what I mean. Like I am trying to make sure this community is as useful to you as possible. Maybe not to you individually, but to like as many people as possible. And I typically work with speakers and et cetera to like make the actual content. So whatever you want, like I can basically, you know, provide that content. So it's most useful. The other channels that you should be aware of is uh, this track events channel, right? What we have here is a very ugly, very, you know, somewhat disorganized spreadsheet that has the recordings of all our past tutorials and also the, you know, Jupyter Notebook or co Colab Notebook, right? So for example, uh, last year we did a uh, straight part data science mini bootcamp. And uh, if you look at the, you know, let's, let's look at one of the examples, the first one. So if you click on this link, you can immediately view the whole lecture again, right? 
So that's like nice and easy, et cetera. Um, and if you want to essentially do the homework and then actually run the code, all you have to do is click on this link. And this is actually, this will look like Jupyter Notebook, but this is actually backed by Google Colab. And then why I previously said that you can like use a different backend. So here's where you can, you know, tell Google, hey, like I want to use one of your free GPUs. But for this notebook, we don't need to. So we can just use none. And then uh, this is essentially a notebook that you can, you know, run for yourself, right? This is, this is a notebook that like is now private to you. There's nothing you can do that's going to mess this up for other people. So if I, you know, if I'm playing around and make a mistake and it doesn't compile, you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on, like whatever, right? So that's also possible. We actually have a channel called Help Me where if you have any questions related to machine learning, data science, um, even like career related questions, uh, you can come here and just like post your question. The more specific, the better. And usually uh, one of our technical mentors or volunteers will like jump in to help you to the point where they're actually going to your uh, your version of the notebook and look at what you did and figure out what's wrong and help you fix it and explain things to you, right? So usually the response time, you know, I'm very proud of is like usually within a day, if not a couple hours. I personally check this channel like four times a day, even though like I will never mark myself as online, but I'm usually there. So feel free to like uh, use the resources that's available. If you feel like, um, like us actually rerunning this bootcamp will be something that will be beneficial to you. Cause sometimes, you know, you're not motivated. You feel like you might have too many problems and you don't know like who to ask, then uh, let us know and we can actually rerun the bootcamp again. Uh, but we also have some other content plan like a mini uh, machine learning bootcamp, a mini, mini deep learning bootcamp, a uh, bootcamp specific to ethical and private and data uh, secure encrypted AI. So that's all coming up, vote and we'll, we'll make that happen. Um, cool, so that is my very long answer to Deepika and also a tour of the community. Uh, uh, if I might, sorry, if I might add to that, um, one uh, thing is even though like what I had presented might seem a little intimidating if you've not worked with Python before, um, Scikit-learn actually has a really good um, readable, really good way to write like readable code. Um, so I would suggest like start with actually using that function and then figuring out later on how each and every piece of that function works. And you, you, you can as well start with uh, simple toy data sets that are out there and um, just start using it. Yeah, I, so there's two more questions. Vanessa, do you want to take them? Yeah. Yeah, um, so there was one question around what is the best way to pre present your project to a data scientist? Um, so honestly, um, if you have uh, worked in any of the Kaggle contests or um, done a lot of analytical work, the first thing would be try and open up your GitHub um, and put up a repository out there and uh, put out as many comments as possible, try to put it on your LinkedIn. When you're interviewing people know that um, you're probably new with the experience, but having all of that up already kind of shows the enthusiasm and interest and will take your application further. Um, and when it comes to presentation, uh, it depends on what kind of uh, role you're applying for. Is it um, more on, um, analytical side or is it more on the machine learning and software development side? If it is more on the software development side, then um, making sure that you actually have implemented uh, some functions, have a lot of uh, um, good coding structure around it would really help. But if yours is more on the analytics side, um, you could probably um, just have a lot of uh, exploratory data analysis and things like that where you don't have to make your code um, very, like you don't have to make it very complex. You can probably use Jupyter Notebook or something like that. Hope that helps. Yeah, and uh, I can I can add to this. Um, so I am gonna share my screen again. Uh, okay. So I am actually working on an article with a uh, like, um, like like an on online publisher about specifically this topic. And uh, like, this is actually some of the questions you can expect in an interview. And these are the questions I used to like 
interview engineers who are like, you know, more newer data scientists. So I want to know, like, if you know when to use the algorithm and when you should not use it. And I also want to know, you know, the details of how this algorithm that you're using or talking to me about compares and contrasts with uh, other algorithms, right? Um, I want to know that you understand the underlying assumptions. For example, like one of the assumptions for linear regression is that there's no like collinearity. I want to know if you have checked that in the data and if you know to what degree does the data violate those assumptions. Like a lot of the cases like, yeah, like we'll still run regression on, you know, like non, uh, like somewhat correlated features. But uh, I need to know that you are, you, you know about the assumptions that you did check for it. Um, the other things that I might ask you is like what parameters and hyperparameters uh, do you, do you, did you, did you like optimize? And I want to know, you know, why you optimize those hyperparameters because there are just a lot of parameters that you can possibly tune. And I want to know, you know, which ones are important and exactly what they, what, what the, what the parameter does, right? If you're turning the knob this way, what does it do and vice versa? Um, if you're actually like applying for a role that has to do with like getting code into production, I need to, I need to see that you understand how the algorithm scales with more data and if how it handles like uh, sparse data or imbalanced data. And also um, like what is the, what is the runtime complexity, right? Especially if you're heading towards more of an engineering role instead of a more like data uh, analysis kind of role. Um, yeah. And then here's actually how I recommend people talk about their projects. And this is actually something you should put into your, um, your GitHub readme. So if I go to my GitHub right now, um, like, by the way, this is, this is like not like the, the most amazing example, GitHub, but th this kind of like shows you how you can use your GitHub intelligently to like demonstrate that you're like a, like a good person to talk to. Um, so if I go to my homepage, um, let's, let's look at this one, right? So here I like described what, uh, what these projects are like doing. And then I put into like, I, I described like the methods I used, the analysis, some of the challenges, etc. So make sure you have a readme and make sure you format it nicely for like, for your, for your own portfolio projects. Uh, but going back to like how you should answer th these kind of questions in the interview, um, so first of all, you should like describe what your project is trying to do. You should describe the data and then you should also talk about how you did like data prep, future engineering, uh, what interesting correlations did you discover during the exploratory data analysis? Uh, not all of these will turn out to be useful. And I want to know like if you validated that these are useful features or not useful features. Um, I want to know what initial models you tried. So like I said, the most common, you know, commonly deployed and tried models are like linear regression, uh, gradient boosted decision tree. Uh, and if you have like just, you know, one, one column for feature like your sales data, even a moving average will be like uh, very suitable. What I don't want to see here is that you tried some complicated model right off the bat. That just tells me that you are someone who's like um, just trying algorithms because they're cool. And also that typically indicates a lack of experience. So don't, you know, like don't, don't immediately just be like, oh yeah, I try like a neural network model and blah, blah. Um, that's actually a counter pattern in an interview. Um, and then maybe talk about like one to three major decisions and challenges you had to, you had to like deal with in your, 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 you know, project. You can be like, oh, the data is not balanced and I did this, or you can say, you know, this algorithm does not perform well category with data. I did that, et cetera. And then, uh, I want to know like what, like, what was the process you used to resolve them? And it's, it's okay even if you're making mistakes, but I want to know that you're logical and you, um, had the right process and you are able to communicate that to me. And then lastly, if this is a real, uh, you know, real project, uh, talk about the use case and client impact. This is very important because uh, if I'm hiring you for like a real job and this is not like a academic research role, um, I want to know that you think about the end users and you, you, want, to, you want to actually like make your stuff useful, right? Uh, and even if this is, a, this is a project that has no client or you just did a Kaggle project or you just use some like random data um, just for your portfolio, you should you should still talk about it as if there were people that you're trying to benefit. So these are some tips and tricks to help with uh, uh, to help with you know your 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 interviews and how you should talk about projects. Uh, yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, there's like I think two more questions. Uh, Manaza, do you want to answer the last two? Um, sure. So there is one on ideas for volunteer. Oops. Ideas for volunteering as a data scientist. Um, 
Honestly, I have looked at uh, communities close by that are a lot of uh, meetup groups. Um, there's actually a bunch in Atlanta. So I would start with that. Um, also, um, trying to, if, if you're working closely with a team that is already doing data science, I would encourage you kind of job shadow them, spend some time with them to understand what it entails. And that can give you more ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I can I can add my perspective to this. Um, I like also learned data science, and machine learning myself. Um, and there was a stage where I feel like I was useful enough, but no one would give me a job, right? <laughs> so like that's that's very relevant. Um, so first of all, you need to like diagnose yourself. Like at what stage are you? Like are you if I actually give you a data set, are you actually capable of like showing me interesting information and showing me like uh, you know uh, useful work, right? Um, if you're not quite there yet, or if you're not sure, I highly recommend just building your own personal projects. Pick a data set you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in plants or bees, then just find that kind of data. And then, uh, you know, let your curiosity guide you. Once you're confident that, oh, like I found out really cool things about this kind of data, then that both gives you confidence and also gives you uh, evidence to show like someone uh, you're, you're trying to volunteer with, right? Because, uh, yeah, like, you know, you're like, hey, I'm trying to volunteer. Like, this is a good thing for you. Why don't you give me a chance? Um, the reality is that a lot of data scientists and ML people are actually very busy and they don't want to, um, they don't want to take on someone when they know they don't have the time to mentor them and lead to a good outcome for both the person being the mentor and also the person offering to volunteer, right? So a lot of times it's not you. It's just that they know, like, they won't have time to, like, uh, you know, get you to the next level. So don't, 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 you know, be discouraged. And uh, so when you're talking to those people, you can be like, hey, you know, I know I don't have industry experience and I know you're looking for someone with industry experience, but check out these like five projects I did and the cool things I found out. And at that point, uh, they'll be like, oh, like this person did legit work and uh, this, this, you know, is good code and the analysis is solid and that will give them more confidence to want to bring you on and then they help you get to the next level, right? So the beginning stage is the hardest. And this is exactly why like I built this community because like we just need to help people bridge the gap, right? So if you look at the, um, if you look at the track events uh, spreadsheet and if you open one of the notebooks that's uh, in there, so I'll share my screen again, um, going back to this, right? So if you look at, if you look at the notebook, like we actually propose, like we, we have code examples that you can immediately run and get the results and you can follow. But at the same time, we have a bunch of like homework assigned, right? So what I actually recommend people do who are very new, who don't may maybe necessarily have enough projects to be able to provide evidence that they're like immediately able to contribute is uh, take a different data set and go through all the same steps and make sure like you're able to complete the homework assignments, right? For the data set that you have chosen. And make sure you choose a data set that's not like the Titanic data set or some like easy one known data set. That, that's not interesting to me because there are too many existing solutions. I cannot tell if you did an analysis yourself or did you just like, you know, use someone else's example. Um, so that's like a quick way to instantly, if you go through those three part mini data science bootcamp, end up with like three portfolios. If you use three different data sets to be able to tell people, hey, I know what I'm doing. Like, this is what I did before. I can, you know, volunteer to do the same thing for you. Uh, yeah. Cool. We're now at 7.15 and uh, I'm going to end this call. Uh, you know where to find us. Uh, you have Manassas email. Uh, uh, there's one small favor I want to ask of you and uh, that is to retweet and thank our sponsor. Uh, as you know, Manessa is a uh, data scientist with uh, Home Depot. They're a, uh, you know, like they basically, Home Depot provides funding to like run this track, right? So if you can take a minute and, uh, uh, you know, just like retweet and uh, maybe say thank you, uh, you know, on that uh, on, on that tweet. Uh, that will make our sponsors feel like warm and fuzzy, and they will be more likely to fund us uh, in the future. And that way, we can keep this program going and uh, keep the community, you know, active and engaged. So much appreciated. Uh, please do retweet, and that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be on Slack. So yeah, Manessa, do you have any last minute things? Any last minute advice? Um. No, but I would urge everybody to use this. And also, um, if you found certain things with my presentation that can be improved, I would really appreciate um, any and all feedback. Cool. All right. Uh, 
stay tuned for the next webinar. Yeah. Thank you. Peace.